a few weeks ago, um, I had to go and see the eye doctor, and um, I, noticed, I noticed that there were some things off in the distance that I was having a little bit of trouble seeing, and some things up close that I was have, having a little bit of trouble seeing, and so I made the appointment and uh, went to my eye doctor, and I love going to my eye doctor. He's a believer, and so I go, and we end up talking about things far more important than my vision, and, um, but you go to the eye doctor, and if you've been recently, you know how humbling of an experience this can be for us, right? So I walked into the eye doctor office. I was fairly confident. I can't maybe see things the way that I used to, but it's not that bad. And so I walked in, and the first thing that they did was they sat me down at this little table, and there was this machine that was innocent looking enough. And and I sat down, and they said, put your eyes right up to the lenses. And so I did. And then the lady on the other side of the machine says to me, don't worry, this won't hurt. (laughs) Like, I don't care what kind of doctor I'm at, that's not the first thing I want to hear them say. And so I'm sitting there with my eyes against the lenses, and all of a sudden there's this poof of air right into my eyeballs, and, and i just taken a totally aback, and I'm thinking to myself, man, what did I ever do to you? Like, why, why are you doing this to me right now? And, and so my pride took a little bit of a hit in that moment, and so I, I got up, and, and she took me into the exam room, and then the doctor came in, and you sit down in the big chair, and then, and then he puts this big machine down in front of you, and he says, look into the lenses, and he starts flicking the lenses back and forth, you know, like, is one better, is two better, is three better, is four better, right? And so he starts doing that. And then off on the opposite wall, they put up these letters and ask you to read them. And so by God's grace, they begin with the biggest letters possible, right? So I'm sitting there looking through this machine, my eyes up against the lenses, and the doctor says, start reading them. And, and by that point, my confidence is back, right? Like seriously, in that moment, I felt like the Lion King. My chest is puffed up and, and I'm like, that's an E, doctor. <laughs> Anybody else see that? just me. Okay. All right. That's, that's fantastic. And so, so from that point forward, like the rest of the test was completely downhill. And like the letters get smaller and smaller and smaller. Those little sentences that they put up in front of you are like teeny tiny. You can't read anything. By the time the test was done, I was walking out of the doctor's office, not even sure I could read anymore. <laughs> and I had pretty much lost the will to live. And so, so I'm walking out and, and the doctor gives me this little piece of paper and this paper has my prescription on it. And I take the prescription and go to an eyeglasses store, and I get my new friends here. And now, yeah, thank you. And, and now I can, I can see things off in the distance, and I can see things up close with a lot more clarity than I used to be able to see. There's a guy in the Old Testament that we're going to meet this morning who is having a really difficult time seeing with any sense of clarity what God is doing in his life. Take your Bible and open with me, if you would, to the book of Habakkuk, the Old Testament minor prophet towards the end of the Old Testament. Uh, Don't worry, I'll keep talking for a few minutes while you scramble to find Habakkuk in your Bibles. You can use the table of contents if you need to. By the way, um, I'm not really sure how to pronounce his name, okay? I'm not sure if it's Habakkuk or Habakkuk or Habakkuk or Chewbacca or, or however it is that you pronounce a name that has three Ks in it. Right, And so I'm going with Habakkuk, but I may alternate back and forth as we go along, and please don't judge me if I do. So we meet Habakkuk, and we are reading this conversation between Habakkuk and God at a time when Habakkuk doesn't clearly see what's happening within his life. He doesn't clearly see what's going on, and these experiences lead him to ask some of the deepest, most profound questions that you and I end up asking as we go through hard times in our lives as well. God, where are you? God, why can't I see you in the midst of what I'm going through? God, why is my marriage like this? God, why am I still not married? God, why are my kids making all of these destructive choices and they're getting closer and closer to the edge? God, why is this illness still hanging on? Why is it not letting go? God, why is the bank account still empty? God, where are you in the midst of all of this? God, how is any of this fair? 
This is what's going on in Habakkuk's life right now. He cannot see clearly what God is doing at this particular point. And I'm sure that there are a number of us in the room right now, you could stand up and you could tell story after story after story in your own life of asking the same questions of God. You remember those times when the pain has been deep and the grief has lingered and the questions have been there and you have laid awake night after night after night crying out to God and saying, God, why this? Why now? Why me? In fact, at some point through this conversation between Habakkuk and God, we find that Habakkuk says that he is placing himself up in his watchtower. He's just going to sit there and he's going to wait for God to show himself in the midst of his questions. He's going to wait for God to come and give him some clarity and give him some answers as to why he's going through what he's going through right now. And I have to think that in a group this size, there are some of us here this morning who have placed ourselves in our own watchtower of sorts. We've put ourselves up there and said, God, I'm just going to wait here until I hear from you. I'm just going to wait here and look out across the horizon of my life, across the horizon of the circumstances that I'm going through right now, and I'm going to wait for you to give me some kind of clarity as to why I'm going through what I'm going through. I want you to understand that my heart in all of this as we make our way through Habakkuk this morning is that God would give me the grace to speak biblical truth into your life right now so that whether you go through deep, dark valleys of your own right now or you go through those times of suffering and pain at some point in the future where you're asking these very questions of God, my hope and my prayer for you, for all of us, is that we will see with clear vision. That we will see with clear vision, not so much in the sense that God is obligated to give us answers to every single question that we ask of him, because he's not, but clear vision in the sense that by the time we're done in God's word this morning, that you will be reinforced in your belief that God alone is able to give me hope in my hardship. That's the big idea that we're going after this morning. God alone is able to give me hope in my hardship. See, Habakkuk arrives on the scene at a time in biblical history when Josiah is the king of Judah. And uh, Judah had a number of good good and godly kings. They also had a number of evil and wicked kings. And Josiah happens to be one of the good and godly kings in Judah. And under his leadership, the people of Judah experienced a number of social reforms that made life so much better for the people within Judah. And they experienced something that could only be described as an Old Testament revival. People are turning away from their sin. There is mass repentance. People are turning to God all over the place and and coming to faith in him. The problem is that when Josiah died, his two sons became the kings over Judah after him. And for the 11 years that they were king over Judah after him, his two sons were evil and wicked. So where Josiah was good and godly, his two boys were evil and wicked and did not pursue the Lord. And for the the duration of their reign as the kings over Judah, all of the social reform that Josiah had brought in was wiped away. And all of the revival that the people had experienced was no longer there. It was all gone. And so it's in the middle of that context now that God comes to Habakkuk and says, I'm bringing judgment on the people of Judah for their sin because they've turned away from me and they won't turn back. So this morning as we make our way through this passage, I want to invite you to pull up a chair and sit at the table and eavesdrop, so to speak on this conversation between God and Habakkuk. And I hope as we go through this conversation that you're reminded of three really important uh, lessons that we learn about why God is our hope in the midst of our hardship. Why he alone is able to give us hope in our hardship. Three lessons to remember about why that is true. But before we do that, let's pray. Father, uh, we do thank you for your word. And we come to you now, Lord, um, in the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit to ask that you would speak to us now in this moment through the truth of your word. God, give me the grace and the strength to faithfully proclaim what you have declared in your word. I pray that it would be the truth that we all need to hear this morning, that you would draw close to us as we do this. 
Lord, we're grateful uh, for what you've given us in your word. I pray, make it clear to us now. I pray for those as well who are here this morning and, and maybe walking through difficult valleys, maybe walking through times of pain and hardship and suffering. And Lord, they don't have answers. They don't have clarity. And Lord, whether you decide to give the kind of clarity that we think we often need, I pray more than anything that we would know again this morning, again, by the indwelling presence of your Spirit, that all of your promises are true, that you are good and you are faithful. So Lord, lead us this morning to the cross, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, three lessons to remember for why God alone is my hope in my hardship. Here's lesson number one. Remember, God is never limited in what he can do. Remember that God is never limited in what he can do. Habakkuk here makes two main complaints against God, and the first here could be framed like this. God, where are you? Where are you? Notice the powerful words that Habakkuk uses here from the very beginning, chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, the oracle that Habakkuk, the prophet, saw. That word oracle means like a burden. Other translations say it's a burden, and that's a very good word to describe the, the weight that Habakkuk is carrying here. Verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise, so the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Basically, Habakkuk is coming before God, and he's saying, God, the world is falling apart around me. Where are you in this? I want to ask you to, to do something right now. Just take... A piece of paper, take your looking to Jesus book and a pen and, and write down one situation that you have been through in the past that has caused you to ask this kind of question to God. God, where are you? God, why can't I see you in this? God, why are you letting this happen? God, why am I going through this right now? I think we've all been through situations like that to some degree or another. Just take that, write it down, keep it in front of you for the remainder of this message. Just one thing that you can look back on and you can remember all of those times alone. You can remember the tears cried. You can remember the questions that were asked and how hard it was for you to walk through that valley of pain and suffering within your life. And isn't it true that as we go through those deep and dark valleys within our lives, that the one thing that we want to know more than anything else is that, God, are you here? God, are you with me? God, do I have the guarantee that as I go through this, that you're not going to leave me? That I can know that you walk with me? Because what I see and what I feel and what I think right now is not lining up with what I know to be true about you. I mean, we don't need anybody to teach us how emotionally gut-wrenching those valleys are, do we? We don't need anybody to teach us how difficult it is for us to walk through those times in our lives. We get the unexpected news that somebody that we love has died. And we didn't get the chance to say goodbye we didn't get the chance to make things right. We get the news that we're not going to have a job in two weeks. We get the news that all of a sudden we have an illness that either may take a really long time to get over or we may never get over. Like We get this unexpected news and all of a sudden it just launches us into a season of grief like nothing we have ever known before. We don't need anybody to teach us how traumatizing that is. And that's where Habakkuk is right now. Look again at verse 2. He says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear or cry to you violence and you will not save? Listen, those, that cry is not just a couple of tears that are randomly falling down his cheeks. This is like a gut-wrenching cry. This is like a guttural, life-changing cry. This is, God, I can't let go of this. 
God, this is all I see. It's all I feel. This is all I think about. This is all I know. This is my life 24-7, and it is eating me up. It's that kind of cry before God. And he says, God, where are you? And God, in his grace, answers Habakkuk in verse 5. This is God speaking now. He says, look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. God says to him, Habakkuk, I'm here. And I'm, I'm working in a way that you wouldn't believe even if I told you. And true to his word, God is about to tell Habakkuk, and Habakkuk does not believe him. In fact, in verse 6, God says that he's going to use the Chaldeans to bring judgment on the nation of Judah. Now, the Chaldeans were a part of the nation of Babylon, and Babylon was the nation that took Judah into captivity, but the Chaldeans were, were part of the nation of Babylon down towards the bottom, and they had a well-earned reputation for being a people that were absolutely ruthless and violent in every possible way. Like, they were among the worst people that you could ever cross. And in fact, God now begins to describe who these Chaldeans are. Take a look at verse 6. He says, For behold, this is God speaking, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who marched through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. In other words, they are so greedy that they take stuff that's not their own, and they feel no guilt about it. Verse 7. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. That is, they are their own law. They have no accountability to anybody. Verse 8, their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. He's saying they come from all over the place with such speed and intensity. And their only desire is to devour whoever happens to be in their way. Verse 9, they all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. Their power is so overwhelming. They gather their captives like sand. Imagine back in the summer, you went to the beach, and you have your little plastic pail and your little plastic shovel, and you take your little plastic shovel, and you scoop millions of grains of sand in that little plastic shovel into your little plastic pail. That's what God is saying the Chaldeans are like. They come along and they are so incredibly powerful that they can scoop up millions of their enemies at will and overpower them. Verse 10, at kings they scoff and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress for they pile up earth and take it. In other words, they're so arrogant that they make fun of kings and they mock rulers because they know that no one will ever stand up to them. In verse 11, then they sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. They come and go so fast, and when they get what they want, they take off with no second thought about it, and they delight in their power so much that they worship it. These are the people that God says he is raising up to bring judgment on the people of Judah. And I don't think that there's a single one of us in the room right now who could blame Habakkuk for not understanding a single thing that God just said to him. Like, imagine, there he is, listening to what God is saying, and he's like, God, are you kidding me? Like, are you serious? You are raising up this people who are known for their violence and their ruthlessness, and they are going to come along and take the people that you have made a covenant with, the people that you have promised to be faithful to. You're going to send them onto your people as a measure of judgment and discipline for the sin that they have committed and because they are not turning back to you. God, do you not remember your promise to them? God, where are you in the midst of this? I mean, we're thousands of years removed from this conversation, and we don't understand it. God, how could you let this happen in my life? God, how could you let this circumstance spiral so far out of control? How could you let this illness into my life? God, where are you in the midst of this? Because this doesn't make any sense to me. There's one lesson that we need to remember in the midst of our suffering and our pain as we're walking through these deep and dark valleys that Habakkuk is learning right here. God is never limited 
in the resources that he can and will use to bring his people back to himself. God is never limited in the resources that he can and will use to bring his people back to himself. See, we need to, we need to approach it like this. We may never understand the way God does things, but we must never forget why God does things. We may not, never understand the way that God brings things about, but we can never forget why God brings them about. God is never limited in the resources that he can and will use. Why, why, why? To bring his people back to himself. To draw his people back closer to him. So listen to what this means. This means that God can use the relational breakdown And it means that God can use the illness that will not go away. The illness that hangs on, the treatments that you keep going back for over and over and over again. God can use the prodigal kids that you have such a hard time connecting with and wondering why you can't connect with them. God can use the unmet expectations. God can use the failed dreams. God can use all of that, and he uses all of that to bring us back to him. He uses that to draw us close to him. Listen, God is saying to us in his word right now, I am using the hardships. I am using the pain and the suffering and the valleys that you are walking through right now. I am using that in your life to draw you closer to me. And there may even be some of us in this room right now to whom God is saying in his word, by the power of his Holy Spirit, he is saying right now, I am using the hardships and the suffering and the pain that you are going through in your life right now to root out the sin within your life so that you will turn away from that and so that you will draw close to me. See, loved ones, we have to believe. We have to believe that God is doing something greater in our hardship than just letting us walk through this valley. That somehow he's using this hardship to draw us back and closer to himself. And so instead of us pushing and pushing and pushing against the hardship that is in our life and trying to get out from under it, why not spend that time and energy pressing closer and closer and closer into the God who is trying to draw us closer to him? See, loved ones, we need to remember that God is never limited in what he can do. That leads us then to the second lesson. Remember that God always has a purpose in what he does. Remember that God is never limited in what he can do, but remember that God always has a purpose in what he does. That takes us to chapter 1 and verse 12. Habakkuk now levels his second complaint to God after God has answered his first. Verse 12, he says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. You have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? See, this is no longer just a question of God, where are you? This is now a question of God, if in fact you are here, then why aren't you doing something to stop this? This is um, what we sometimes call the classic problem of evil. And it kind of goes like this. If God is all good and all loving and all powerful, then why is there evil in my life? Why is there evil in the world around me? Maybe more importantly, If God is all good and all loving and all powerful, then why doesn't he do something to stop the evil that I see in my life and all around me? And and we could take it even one step further and say, if God does not stop all of the evil in my life and the evil that I see around me, then does that mean then that God is not all good and all loving and all powerful? The reason that we gather together this morning is because we believe And we affirm that God is all good and all loving and all powerful. And he always will be. And we're going to gather together again next week and affirm the same thing. We're going to gather the week after that and affirm the same thing. And Lord willing, we will gather for the rest of our days and continue to affirm that until the Lord takes us home to be with him. 
the difficulty for us is that when we walk out of these doors in a few minutes, we're going to walk right back into a world that is broken and there is evil all around us. And we're going to be confronted with it. There is no avoiding it. The problem, though, is that we don't really need to walk out those doors to be confronted by the evil and wickedness around us. All we need to do is look in the mirror and see the evil and wickedness within us. And so as we go through hardships, as we go through times of pain and suffering within our life, it is so important for us to remember that God does not cease to be the perfect standard by which we measure all things just because we see evil around us. God is not the one who has failed to meet an expectation. He is not the one who has fallen short of an expectation. We are the ones who have fallen short of an expectation. We are the ones who have fallen short of God's perfect standard of righteousness, which is why we still see evil in us and around us. Maybe you're sitting here right now and you're thinking to yourself, okay, pastor, I... Maybe that kind of answers the question, if God is all good and all loving and all powerful, then why is there still evil in the world? I get that, but it still doesn't answer the question of, if God is all good and all loving and all powerful, then why doesn't he do something to stop it? I don't know. I've got my own questions. And so what we need to keep at the forefront of our mind is that despite all of the pain and the suffering and the evil that we see around us, we all together, we look for the God who guarantees that he can and will defeat evil in the final day. And why do we look for that? Why do we look to the God who guarantees that he will defeat evil in the final day? We look to him because he is all good and all loving and all powerful, and he always will be. It takes us to chapter 2 and verse 1. Habakkuk says, I, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. We don't really know how long Habakkuk waited at this particular point. He could have waited a very long time. That situation that you wrote down a few minutes ago, that situation that you're thinking about, as you reflect back on that and, and as you maybe even walk through a difficult valley right now or as you are about to walk through a valley at some point very soon, ask yourself this, am I willing to wait for God to show me his purposes in my pain? And even more than that, will I be content if the only reason that God brings me through this valley is to bring me closer to him? Will I be content if the only reason that God brings me through this valley is to bring me closer to him? The Lord answers Habakkuk in chapter 2 and verse 2. He says, And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. See, God is saying here that all of these things have their appointed time. So the valleys that you walk through have their appointed time from God. God knows that you're walking through the valley. And God's deliverance of you in that valley has its appointed time. And so as you walk through that valley, and it seems long, and it seems hard, and it seems heavy, wait. Wait for God. See, loved ones, do not despise the times of waiting. You know those times, right? The times where there are no answers, and there are no explanations, and there seems like there's no progress. Don't despise those times of waiting because as hard as those times of waiting can often be for us, those are often one of God's most precious gifts to us because it's in those times of waiting that we see with a lot more clarity that we could see at any other time of our life that our weakness becomes his strength, that our need becomes his grace, and that our sorrow becomes his joy. So don't despise the times of waiting. 
God has an appointed time, not simply for your suffering, but he has an appointed time for your deliverance from it. God talks now about the Chaldeans. You'll notice here in chapter 2 that there are five woes that are pronounced on the Chaldeans. These woes are, are not like, whoa, that was close, or whoa, you cheer for the Montreal Canadiens? <laughs> not like that at all. These are, these are pronouncements of certain judgment, okay? Pronouncements of certain judgment on the people, and you'll notice five of them here in chapter 2. Verse 6, God says, woe to him. He's talking about the Chaldeans. Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. Verse 9, woe to him who gets evil gain from his house. Verse 12, woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Verse 15, woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. Verse 19, woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake to a silent stone, arise. See, God has an appointed time, not simply for your suffering, but from your, for your deliverance from the suffering. God has a plan and a purpose in it all. Even when God uses things in our lives to bring us back to him that we don't understand, that we don't get, God has an appointed time and a purpose for all of it. And we may never understand it, but all of this is punctuated by the reality of chapter 2 and verse 20, where God says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Remember that God always has a purpose in what he does. Third and final lesson. Remember that God is always worthy of our worship, whether we understand or not. He's always worthy of our worship, whether we understand or not. Chapter 3 and verse 1, this is Habakkuk's response now. So he's had this conversation with God. He's leveled two complaints against God. God has answered him both times, and now Habakkuk is responding to God in worship. Notice chapter 3 and verse 1, the prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigianoth. Now, uh, the New American Standard Bible has a footnote that says, that explains verse 1, it says this is a highly emotional poetic form. A highly emotional poetic form. So that means at least two things. The first thing it means is that this chapter here that we're about to read is packed with raw emotion. It's packed with raw emotion. So feel the tone of what Habakkuk is saying here. Okay? Think of that experience that you've been through, that, that experience that you wrote down, the thing that you're going through right now, the deep, dark valley that you don't understand and the grief that you carry. Think about that experience and, and just feel the emotion. You know in that moment how raw it is, how emotional it is. You know the number of nights that you've laid awake and you've cried out to God wondering if he hears your prayers. Feel the emotion of what's being said here in this passage. Because Habakkuk has had his heart ripped out by people that he loves who will not turn away from their sin and they will not turn back to God. Not only that, but he has had his heart ripped out again because he got an answer from God that he never expected. And So don't miss the emotion that is packed into chapter 3. That first verse also means, secondly, that, that he is singing this poem of praise to God. This is a poem of praise that he is now singing back to God. He's at a place in his life where he's like, God, I don't understand this. God, I don't know why I'm walking through this valley. I don't know why you've allowed this suffering into my life. I don't know why I'm here. But what I do know is that you have shown me goodness. What I do know is that you have shown me love and kindness all the way along. And so because of that, I am determined to worship my way through this. So that's exactly what he does. Chapter 3, verse 2. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. In other words, Habakkuk is saying, God, I don't want to be the guy who's only going to look back on history and just read about the great things that you have done. God, I want you to do it now. God, I plead with you. Please do your work now. God, please save your people now. God, please deliver us now. He goes on in verse 3. God came from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. 
His splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. Skip down to verse 11. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of your mighty waters. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will wait quietly for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. So notice what he's doing here. Habakkuk is going all the way back to the Exodus. He's going all the way back to the time of Moses and Joshua where God rescued his people from captivity and he led them into the promised land. See, loved ones, there need to be times in our lives where we look back at those moments where God rescued us from the captivity of our problems, where he rescued us from the captivity of the valleys that we were walking through, where he brought us out of the specific hardships and we remember the faithfulness of God. We come back to him and say, God, I remember your goodness to me. I remember your power in my life in that circumstance. And God, because you have been faithful in the past, I will praise you in the present. Notice here, though, that there is a huge measure of humility that Habakkuk is displaying before God. Saying, God, I don't get why we're here. I don't understand. He's at the end of this whole journey, loved ones. He is still in the valley. He is still in the darkness. He still does not have an answer from God. You need to see that. He still does not have clarity. And yet he comes before God in humility and says, God, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait quietly for you to deliver your people. As you and I go through the pain and the suffering and the hardship of wherever it is that God takes us, we go through the deepest, darkest portions of that valley and in humility, we must cry out to God and say, God, I will wait quietly for you. God, help me. what Habakkuk did. It leads him now to a song of praise. Notice verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places to the choir master with stringed instruments. Now, notice what he is saying here. He's coming before God, and and part of his song that he's singing back to God, he's saying, there is no food. There is no livestock. There is no livelihood. Let's translate that into what we experience today. There is no food. There's no money in the bank. There's no job to go to. There's this illness that I have that keeps hanging on and it won't let go and I've got another treatment coming up and I don't know how much more I can take. And there's been a tragedy in my family. There's been a tragedy with a friend and I don't understand why it had to happen now, why it had to happen the way that it did. There's all these things going on. Verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Take that situation that you wrote down at the beginning of the message. 
that situation where you remember the sleepless nights, you remember the questions asked, but you look back on that now and you remember how God got you through and realize that God's faithfulness in the past will lead me to praise him in the present. So that when you walk through the valley now, when you walk through the valley at some point in the future, you will be determined to worship your way through this. See, loved ones, we have to believe, we have to believe that hardship and hope can coexist. We have to believe that those two things can exist at the same time. And the only reason that we can believe that hardship and hope coexist is because we belong to the God who is all good and all loving and all powerful all the time. And so you can take the hardest experiences of your life. You can take the deepest pain that you have been through, the darkest valleys that you have walked through, and you can tell that to God. Tell him. Tell him what you're feeling. Tell him what you're thinking. Tell him what you're seeing. Tell him that to you, from your limited human perspective, it doesn't line up with what you seem to know to be true about him. Loved ones, the Bible is full of psalms and songs and lamentations of people who cry out to God from the very anguish of their souls. So whatever it is that you're going through and whatever grief you're trying to process, as hard as that is, as painful as it may be, tell him. Cry out to your God. I got to think that in a room this size, there's got to be hundreds of what David calls in Psalm 23, shadows of death. There's got to be hundreds of shadows of death that are represented in this room, maybe hundreds more that we don't even yet know about. But David says in Psalm 23, verse 4, one of the most popular passages in the Bible, maybe one of the most popular verses in the Bible. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And the key word in that verse in Psalm 23, 4 is the word through. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. See, the reality is, loved ones, we all go through pain and suffering. We all walk through deep, dark valleys that we don't know how long we're going to be there. We don't know how we're going to get out. But the one who hopes in God in the midst of the hardship will never get stuck in the valley. Okay? The, The lingering shadow of darkness and death are not the end for the one who knows that God is their shepherd. Because this good shepherd will lead us through. He will take care of us. We have to believe that hardship and hope can coexist. And we have to believe that those two things can coexist because we see hardship and hope most clearly at the cross. Jesus Christ was falsely accused and wrongly convicted and ultimately sentenced to die. An innocent man. To die for guilty sinners just like you and me. And much like Habakkuk didn't understand God's plan, the disciples stood by and watched as Jesus died and they had little understanding of why this was happening and even more so why God was not stepping in to try and do something to stop it. Even Jesus from the cross looks and says, my God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? And yet when we look at the cross, one of the greatest lessons that we learn is that Jesus stood up under the greatest hardship that humanity has ever known. He took the full weight of your sin and my sin upon himself. He took the full weight of all of the sins of every person who would ever believe in him, past, present, and future, all of it put upon Jesus as he was on the cross. He stood up under the greatest hardship ever known to humanity, but that greatest hardship was punctuated by a resurrection of hope. See, loved ones, you and I will never be able to walk through the deep, dark valleys by ourselves. We will never be able to make it through the most painful, gut-wrenching, emotional experiences by ourselves because we're not smart enough to figure it out. We're not strong enough to get through it. We need to turn to the one who stood up under the greatest hardship that humanity has ever known and trust that the strength of our good shepherd will be enough to lead us through. That is our hope in the midst of our hardship. So whatever it is that you're going through this morning, whatever grief, whatever pain that you happen to be carrying right now or that you might be carrying at some time in the not-too-distant future, look to the cross. Fix your eyes on Jesus. 
So why can we have hope in our hardship? I want to leave you with three things. Why can you have hope in your hardship? First of all, because our God is the saving God. Notice again, chapter 2 and verse 4. Flip back there if you would. Chapter 2 and verse 4, God says, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Now keep in mind that Habakkuk is living at a time when judgment is about to come on the people. And there is no avoiding this judgment. And the main question that Habakkuk is asking, the main question that the people of Judah need to be asking is this, how can I be certain that I will be delivered from God's judgment in the end? And the answer for them back in that day is the very same answer for us today. Put your hope in God. How can I be certain that I'll be delivered from God's judgment in the end? Put your hope in God. This is the beautiful doctrine that we call justification by faith. It's the reality that God counts a person as righteous before him because Jesus Christ died for that person and that person has believed in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. So they have been justified by faith in him. This is what allows you and me to stand before the God whom Habakkuk describes as pure and holy, who cannot look at evil and who cannot look upon wrong. This is what allows you and I to stand before the God who Habakkuk says, in your wrath, remember mercy. Like this is the heart of the gospel. This is what Christ has done for us. And so we look to the cross because our God is a saving God. But second, our God is the satisfying God. All of these judgments that are mentioned in chapter 2, all these five woes, these are still things that plague our world today. And yet the promise remains that there is not one single cubic inch of space on the face of the planet that will not know God's glory. Chapter 2, verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Just think about this for a minute. Think about how spectacular that is. That it doesn't matter how dark your valley is. It doesn't matter how deep and painful it is. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter where the valley is. The promise remains that the glory of God is able to shine brightly in the midst of that deep and dark valley. God will meet you there and he will walk you through. Our God is the saving God. Our God is the satisfying God. And then notice this third, our God is the sovereign God. Our God is the sovereign God. Chapter 2 and verse 20 says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Norman Geisler is a philosopher and a theologian. He says that the presence of hardships actually do not deny the existence of God. If anything, the presence of hardships actually cry out for the reality that God is there. The presence of hardships within our life cry out for the reality that God is there. And there's at least two reasons that that is true. Number one, the only real help in our hardship comes from Jesus Christ. That's the only help that we have. Remember that time when the disciples were following Jesus and there was a large crowd that was following in behind them and all of a sudden there were just dozens and dozens of people that were just walking away from Jesus because the teaching was too hard? And Jesus then looked at the disciples and says, what about you guys? Are you going to walk away too? Do you remember what they said? He said, Lord, where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else are you going to go in a time of hardship, in a time of pain and suffering and grief within your life? Loved ones, there is nowhere else to go. Jesus Christ is our hope. The second reason that it's true that the presence of hardships cry out for the existence of God is this. The only realistic expectation that suffering will end is that Jesus Christ has already defeated it at the cross. He's already defeated our suffering, our pain at the cross because he is the saving God, he is the satisfying God, and he is the sovereign God.